honored to have Truett Adair here this morning. He is connected with the Sunset School of Preaching, but you know as you were here for the Bible class and learning so much is happening around the world, in particular in Cuba, uh, not limited there, but that we are involved with uh, the work there. And then with the, uh, you remember the uh, solar players that we helped raise money for, and they have been distributed um, throughout the Spanish-speaking countries. And we are helping with that, and the word continues to be preached. And uh, I give you now, Brother Truett Adair. <laughs> it is good to be with you today. Uh, I enjoyed Bible class sharing some of the stories of some of the people that you have helped to provide Bible training for in Cuba over the last uh, almost decade that you've been involved there. And, and I appreciate you so much for what you are uh, doing, have done, and continue to do in that to, in that great place and it's always a good thing when the PowerPoint comes up on time. Uh, I appreciate all the technology people that make this kind of thing possible. Well, uh, our solar player ministry has been so effective. We continue to finish up. Uh, we've got a couple of months to go to finish up uh, a number of solar players in, in Latin America. Your help has continued to be, uh, we continue to need your help to, to finish up this work. And then I want to make kind of a, uh, a big announcement that uh, next year, our plan for those solar players is to take them, them to the Philippines. Philippine islands are, are huge. That archipelago, uh, composed of dozens of islands that are inhabited. Uh, there are maybe up to a thousand congregations scattered in mountain villages in the Philippines. In many of those areas of the Philippines, there is no electricity. We plan to provide next year 2,000 solar players for the Philippines, plus about 200 solar players for the Arabic refugees that are in Europe. Arabic speaking refugees that need to hear the gospel story in Arabic. Uh, and they are more receptive now, those Muslim refugees are more receptive now than ever before. So your help continues to be needed for that great ministry and for the work in Cuba. What a, what a great work that is. And we're thankful that you're involved with us in that and have been for many, many years. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 13, it says, You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has become tasteless, how will it be made salty again? It is good for nothing except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. But you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. Now, nor do men light a lamp and put it under a peck measure but they put it on a lampstand so that it will light up the whole house. Let your light shine, therefore, before men, that men may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Based on what Jesus has said here, I really do believe it's time for God's church to renew our purpose, to reclaim the mission that he describes in these very, very impressive thoughts about salt and light. Who's to blame when a house is dark? Well, you don't blame the house. 
After all, if the house is dark, that's just something that naturally happens when the sun goes down. A better question to ask is, where's the light? If the meat goes bad, you don't blame the meat. That's just the natural course of events when bacteria invades meat that isn't refrigerated or prepared properly. And, and that bacteria begins to spread and the meat spoils. You don't blame the meat. A better question to ask is, where's the salt? And if society becomes corrupt, if evil is rampant, and does anybody question in light of the, the events of the last few months that there is resident evil in our world? It's all around us. Who do we blame? Well, you can't really blame corrupt society. That's just what happens in a fallen world. That's just what happens when Satan is in control, when he's the God of this world. The better question to ask is, where is the church? We have a job to do. Jesus gave us our mission when he left this earth. And our mission is to provide the remedy for the corruption, the wickedness, the evil, and sin that has invaded our society and our world. So we need to renew and reclaim the Great Commission Jesus said, go make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and behold, teaching them all things that I have commanded you, and I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. We need to reclaim and renew our commitment to the great commandment of Jesus. He said the first and greatest commandment is this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. The lawyer asked, who is my neighbor? In Luke chapter 10. And the answer was the story of the good Samaritan. Anybody that needs you and what you can offer is your neighbor. All of those lost people out there are our neighbors. We have the only answer to the sin of society. But we need to renew our commitment and reclaim our mission with the great compassion Jesus talked about the scene at the last day when all nations are gathered before the throne of God and he puts the goats on one hand and the sheep on the other hand and he says to those on his right hand, Come you blessed of my Father and receive the kingdom prepared for you for the, from the foundation of the world. Did you know God has prepared something for you. And he's had it in mind from before the foundation of the world. Heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. But he talks about the compassion of those prepared people on the society around them. The hurting people in their midst. And he talks about the fact that I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And 
And they said, Lord, when did we see you like that? And he said, in the event that you did it to the least of these, you did it for me. And then he would say to those on the other hand, depart from me, you who are cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Hell is a prepared place too. But God never prepared it for us, folks. He prepared it for all of the wickedness. The final answer. God's final answer. For all the wickedness, all the corruption, all the sin in the world. Is that prepared place. Never was intended for good folks. Never was intended for God's people. It was intended for demons, for Satan and his angels. Because when Jesus was hungry, they didn't feed him. When he was thirsty, they didn't give him drink. When he was sick, they didn't visit him. When he was in prison, they didn't come to him. When he needed clothes, they didn't clothe him. And he said, you, you can just join Satan because it's prepared for him and those that follow him. This great compassion, this reaching out with humanitarian efforts to help the hurricane victims in Houston like some of our students did on their break week, Instead of just enjoying a vacation, they, they loaded up in a van and went down and, and slogged through the, the, the problems in Houston and the water and the, the trees that were falling and they, they helped out their neighbors in Houston. I, I want to tell you, if we want to reach the millennial generation... <laughs> This is their heartbeat. The millennial generation loves helping people who are hurting. If you want to reach the hearts of a younger generation, if you want to uh, touch the lives of people that are willing to get their hands dirty, then give them a job to do to reach out and help the hurting of our society. But we have to learn this lesson, folks. We can't just put band-aids on the hurts of people on their way to hell. The greatest benefit that we can give for hurting humanity, after we have fed them, after we have clothed them, after we have given them the benefit of our love and care, the greatest benefit that we can give them is to tell them the good news of Jesus. So in all of our humanitarian efforts, we need to join that with a redemptive purpose. And if we do that, then God will be blessed and they will be blessed. I'm reminded of a, a widow in Athens, Greece named Rosemary. Rosemary uh, came to Greece along with her husband and her children to kind of win her fortune. She, she came there from Kenya. The whole family came out of poverty in Kenya and came to Greece to kind of advance their case. As she was in Athens, her husband died. She became a single mother raising three children in a strange city with a language that she was just beginning to learn to speak. And how was she going to get along? She, she actually came and enrolled in our Bible school that we have in Athens. It's like our school in Cuba except it in Athens, Greece, and we train uh, workers for the Lord in Athens, Greece, and most of them 
in that school are refugees from other places, Africa, the Middle East, and other places. Rosemary came and joined in our classes. It's a weekend school. She would work for four days and study for three days. One day her son brought a refugee that he had found in the street, an Arabic-speaking refugee that he found in the street that was hungry. And he brought that young refugee to her house and he said, Mom, can we just give him something to eat? And then he continued his practice of going out and finding these, these street folks, these refugees, and bringing them home. And she said, I, I can't raise all of the orphans in, in Athens here. How are we going to do this? She formed a coalition of some Kenyan moms. And they started collecting food together. And they would go out to the train station where these refugees uh, were found in great numbers and they would just pour them some hot tea and give them some bread to eat. And they started that two years ago and today they have a soup kitchen in Athens, these Kenyan moms, and they are feeding sometimes a thousand people a week. But in every one of those cases, they give them the gospel along with their food. You see, they have solar players in the Arabic language. And they're passing out those solar players in addition to giving them their food. And while they're sitting and eating, they put a solar player on each table and it is playing the gospel of Jesus Christ and how to become a Christian. They're ministering not just to the stomach, but to the soul of the people. They're doing it out of a motive of love. Because Jesus said, Love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, honor God, give him the glory. But love your neighbor as yourself. And loving our neighbor means meeting our neighbor's need. But the greatest need that our neighbor has is to know about Jesus and to know the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to tell you that when Jesus spoke those words in answer to the lawyer's question, what's the first and greatest commandment? He rattled off immediately two commandments out of the Old Testament. One in the book of Deuteronomy, one in the book of Leviticus. And he said the first and the greatest is Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now if you think, folks, when we have done that, that we have reached the pinnacle, think again. Because Jesus was quoting the Old Testament. When you have loved God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength and you have loved your neighbor as yourself you have reached the ABC's of love you've reached the very basic level you've reached the Old Testament level and wasn't it Jesus that said if our righteousness doesn't exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees we're in trouble oh no Jesus came along later and to his disciples he had a, a new message. He didn't say love God and love your neighbor as yourself. That's Old Testament. It's good. We need to get there. It's a stair step to get to the next level. But Jesus said to his disciples a new commandment I give you that you love one another 
as I have loved you and so will all men know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The world is going to judge the church by a lot of the good that they see the church doing for each other. That's what Jesus said about the new commandment. That's a, that's a higher level than the Old Testament commandment. Oh, but it's not the pinnacle. Jesus said something else in the Lord's Prayer in John chapter 17. This is the real Lord's Prayer, by the way. <laughs> the one that we call the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6, give us this day our daily bread. That's the disciples' prayer. The disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. And he said, this is how you pray. That's the disciples' prayer. When the Lord prayed, it got a lot deeper than that. In John chapter 17, as he was in the garden before his betrayal, trial, and crucifixion, he prayed and he prayed, verse 21 of John 17, that they may all be one, even as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou didst send me. And then he ended that prayer in verse 26. And we don't talk about this level of love very often. But it's right here in your Bible. In John chapter 17 and verse 26 it says, And I have made thy name known to them, Father, and I will make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them. And that I may be in them. Jesus is going to be in us. We're going to have to learn a higher level of love. We're going to have to love like God loves his son. How much do you think God loved Jesus? <laughs> well, he loved him enough to send him into the world. God not only loved his son Jesus, but he loved the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, the son that he loved, in order that the world might be saved. What I'm saying to us is we need to learn to love not just like the Old Testament describes. We need to learn to love like Jesus loved. And we need to learn to love like God loves. And if we do that, we will not only minister to people's physical needs, but we will minister to their physical need, their spiritual needs, and it's going to make a difference in their life. Love makes a difference, folks. It makes a difference in congregations. In South Sudan, there is a horrible civil war going on right now. And two tribes are warring and they're killing each other and they're, they're burning and killing and raping villages across South Sudan. And now hundreds of thousands of refugees from South Sudan have poured into Uganda, into refugee camps. In one refugee camp, there are 290,000 refugees. Along with all of those refugees, the Lord's church has come to the refugee camp. Solar players are being distributed in those refugee camps. Preachers uh, that are converted in South Sudan are going in there and they're preaching and teaching. They've planted 50 congregations in that refugee camp. Now here's the, here's the point that I want to make to us. The 
refugees came from both the Nuer and Dinka tribes that are warring in South Sudan. They're killing each other there. And the refugees escaping that carnage come from both of those tribes. And when the gospel is preached to them, they come together in the church and they sit side by side in the Lord's church. Traditional enemies, centuries old malice and hatred is dissolved in the love of God in his church. Does that say to us that unity ought to be what we're about in the body of Jesus Christ? We just need to love each other enough to hang in there together and to be God's people in his church and to take that commission, that gospel of Jesus Christ, that message of salvation, to take it as far as Jesus wanted it to be taken. It was his intent that we preach the gospel, that we be Christ in a, in a world that is lost. It was the extent that he described when he said, go into all the world. To Cuba, to Athens, Greece, to South Sudan, to Uganda, to Mexico and Honduras, and to every community in the United States of America. That's the extent of the commission. The content is so important, folks. We cannot give up on preaching it like it's written. We've got to teach and preach the message of Jesus, the message of the cross, the message of salvation. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation. If we compromise the message, the message loses its power to save. Keep the message like God intended. Paul said it like this when he came to Corinth. He didn't compromise. He said, I did not come to you with excellency of speech or of human wisdom. I came to you knowing only Christ and him crucified. The message of the cross, just like God intended it, was preached in Corinth and what a difference it made in the corruption, the wickedness, the evil that was in that, that great city because Paul didn't compromise the message. He just preached it like God intended it. You see, Jesus came into this world to exchange his righteousness for our sin. And that's what 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21 says. He who knew no sin was made to be sin, that is our sin offering, in order that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And I'm here to tell you today that we can't change that message. But we need to change some of our methods of communicating and getting that message to a worldwide audience and to audiences right here at home. There are changing opportunities and we need to change our method of reaching out with the gospel to meet those changing needs, never compromising the message. We live in an age that is changing rapidly, and it has been for many, many years. There was a religious conference in the year 1870 at a religious university. 
The speaker for that conference was the president of that university. And he stood up and he told that great crowd that was there for the conference, we live in an age when changes are on the horizon that are going to change our world. There will be inventions that are coming down the pike that are going to change the way we do things. And after the lecture was over, the bishop over that area in that religious denomination went up to the president of the university and he said, I'm intrigued by your speech. And when you say there are going to be a lot of changes and a lot of great inventions that will change our world, what are you talking about? And the university president said, well, one of the greatest things that is right on the horizon that I believe we will do before long is I believe we're going to be able to fly through the air like birds. He was rebuked by the bishop of that denomination. The bishop of that denomination said, that is blasphemy. The Bible says that only angels can fly. If God had intended us to fly, he would have given us wings. And when that little spat and argument was finished, Bishop Wright went home to his little family, to his wife, and to his two sons, whose last name was Wright, and their first names were Orville and Wilbur. Now for those of you that are under 40 years of age, it was Orville and Wilbur Wright <laughs> that flew that first, uh, what, 100 yards or so that launched the air age in our world. Isn't it amazing that sometimes we are so close and so far away from the imagination of a God who can do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or all that we can imagine. I'm simply saying to us folks, it is time for us to imagine greater. It's time for us to lift up our eyes and look on the fields that are white unto harvest and to cast a vision for doing more than we do to reach out to a world that is desperately lost. I want us to, uh, to have the invitation song in just a moment. And I want to compare the way we offer the invitation today to the way that it's offered in other places. The invitation here in America goes something like this in most churches. If you will come forward and if you will confess your faith in Jesus Christ, be immersed in the forgiveness of your sins, if you will repent of all of those sins, And we'll take you back in a nice changing room. Everything is convenient for you. The change of clothing is there. Everything will be fine. The water is just right. It's clean. We've made it as convenient as possible for you to be baptized. Now the invitation in those refugee camps that I spoke of is a little different. It goes like this. If you want to become a Christian, it's not going to be convenient. In fact, even baptism is a problem here. There's not enough water in this refugee camp to baptize you. We'll have to walk for miles down to a river. We don't know what's in that water, in that river. There are all kinds of things that may be there, including crocodiles. And we'll try to 
as you're baptized in that dirty water among the crocodiles, we'll try to beat the water with a stick long enough to keep the crocodiles away so that you can be baptized. But hey, if the crocodiles get you, then you just get to go to heaven sooner. Well, aren't you glad that our invitation isn't quite like that here at the Hampton Church of Christ? But if you're subject to God's invitation, even if there were crocodiles in that baptistry, you would still need to be baptized. You would still need to come to Christ. If you're subject to God's invitation today, for any reason, we hope you'll come and as we stand and as we sing to encourage you.